respected uh, Father Jayapati Ji, respected Father Andrew, respected Reverend Thomas, Dr. Gautamanji, uh, Miss Ratna. Uh, special thanks to Professor Dr. Bernard Dasami for putting this together. Mr. Sandeep Rai Rathod, Abrar, friends, respected members of the journalistic fraternity. The shape of this room is a little unusual, so I don't know whether to look here or whether to look here. <laughs> so I'm going to start you know, twisting and turning throughout my speech. Um, I became a member of parliament about 10 years ago. And uh, as was mentioned, I decided not to take a salary because I felt that those of us who don't need to shouldn't be a burden on the state. In 2014, I started a movement that has been mentioned. And, uh, but I realized something after that movement was over, which was that whether in India you help one person or whether you help 5,000 people, it's still a drop in the ocean. And the only way that you can really influence the lives of, say, 500 or 600 million people simultaneously is by influencing, determining, and transforming government policy. There is really no other way to effect national transformation in a social and economic manner. And it is that endeavor that actually caused me to do a deep dive on the subjects that I'm going to be speaking on before you. Because I felt that you know, it's not incumbent upon us to know things as experts when we're in politics, but it should be. Because if you don't know enough, then exactly what are you doing determining the lives of a billion people before you? And so I took two years off. I traveled the country. I traveled in this beautiful state of yours, and I met people, I listened to them, I took extensive field notes, and what you have before you is a result of all that process. I started my journey in a small village in Uttarakhand called Raini in Almora district. And I started there because the Chipko movement started there of Sundarlal Bahuguna and Chandi Prasad Bhatt, <coughs> which I think was really the first pan-national environmental movement anywhere in the world. And it's because of, and that movement occurred when there were no telephones, when there was no railway networks, where there was really no way to connect people easily. And as yet, these two elderly people went across the country telling people not to cut trees and, in fact, the value of the environment for future generations. Two years ago, I was in Bangalore giving a lecture. And uh, I saw in the papers a similar movement. There was a steel flyover being built. And for that, 8,000 trees, the oldest trees in Bangalore, were being cut. And students made a WhatsApp group. And they said that anybody who gives a missed call on this WhatsApp group, we will consider to be with us. And they got 1.8 lakh WhatsApp calls, missed calls in one day. And then they felt emboldened. And then they said, OK, whoever's with us, please form a human chain around these trees to save them. And 15,000 young people came to save the trees on a Sunday. And it had such a tremendous impact that the chief minister rescinded his order and he said, OK, now we will try and build this steel flyover, go back to the drawing board with architects without cutting a single tree. And that's the power of young people and of citizens all over the country today. When we look at people power, we, it is important that we look at inequality. Because inequality is a strain all throughout my book. Um, my book is basically policy oriented, but I want to talk about its thematic uh, sense to you. In 2013, 
a retired teacher from Alwar in Rajasthan called Deep Chand Sharma wrote a letter to the then Prime Minister where he said that I would like to give one lakh rupees that I've saved to the poorest person in India. He got the letter back saying, we have no idea who the poorest person in India is. Uh, he then sent the check and the letter back saying that, could you give it to one out of the 100,000 poorest people in India? They s again, they returned it saying, we have no idea who the 100,000 poorest people in India are. The day I read this news in a newspaper, the front page of the newspaper said, congratulations, India, we have our 70th billionaire. And I thought, you know, in this vulgar um, celebration of wealth, somewhere has the last man in society completely evaporated from the national narrative. And the truth is that somewhere he has. You know, we uh, look at several things when looking at inequality. I just want to mention one, and that is water, right? I did a lot of uh, research on water, particularly in the state of Maharashtra. Uh, and I went to Latur, which is in Marathwada, which is completely water starved, where people are now leaving all their villages because they have no sustainable form of existence. And uh, when I went there, uh, five farmers had committed suicide within the space of one week. And the chief minister did something good, which is he sent a water train with about three quarters of a million liters of water. The train was looted 16 times. It was looted for 10 liters and 15 liters and 20 liters of water. After that, I went to give a lecture at the University of Bombay after my field study was done. And when I went there, while I was driving to the university, I saw a big hoarding. It said Aquaria Grand, a building that is being built with 200 apartments and 200 full-size swimming pools. And I said, you know, what a, what a crazy you know, piece of hypocrisy that in the state where people are looting trains for water, some crazy person is building a building with 200 full-size swimming pools in one building. And I thought there's no greater example to look at. And then I started looking at water more deeply. And I took one uh, village in District Nasik, just one. And it was a big village with about, uh, I would say, about 6,000 people. And I just looked at water consumption between the several economic strata of that village. And what I found was the richest person in that village, the biggest landlord in that village, consumed 30 times more water every day than the poorest person in that village. And this is across the country, across the board, I found. Just three districts in Maharashtra, which is Mumbai, Pune, and Thane, three out of 36 districts consume 59% of water. And when I asked the water minister that what is the reason for this, he said it's very simple. Water is now a monetized asset, so those who pay more get more. Uh, it's a you know, very frightening thing. And the cities of Maharashtra, whether it's Aurangabad, it's Nasik, it's Nagpur, or Pune, or Bombay, together have 21% of the population. And they consume. 69% of the water. So in India, there is no greater inequality to look at than the base product that we look and we take for granted. When I started looking at water, I started looking at agriculture, right? Because that's where the water is consumed the most. And I started looking at the fact that, let's say, Punjab, which contributes 23% of total rice production, right? has 90% blocks in its state which are water stressed. So frankly, it should not be producing paddy. And Maharashtra, which has almost 100% water stressed blocks in certain rural regions, produces sugarcane, which again, it, it has no need to produce. So what we are looking at in our country is 
that we are incentivizing through political favor really the death of agriculture. Because if we look at the fact that you are forcing people or rather incentivizing people to grow certain crops which in effect are causing their land to be desertified one generation down, then you're really doing them no service. You know, our conversational tone about farmers and farmer loans needs to change. And I'm going to tell you a statistic now that's really going to blow your mind because it blew mine when I first heard it. If you take every single rupee that has been paid out to farmers, center and state in this country, every single rupee that has been paid out from central loans to state loans on one hand, and you take every single rupee that has been paid to the 100 top industrial families in this country from 1952 to 2015, because I did this study. So on one hand, you have 61% of the population. And on one hand, you have 100 families. You're talking about 1,000 people. And you know what? If you add up every single rupee that's been given to farmers, it's only 19% of the money that's just been given in loan subsidies, loan waivers, and credit defaults, etc., to 100 industrial families in India. So when we talk about giving farmers right to food grants, loan waivers, let us remember, please, that the NPA crisis in India today is not, I repeat, the NPA crisis in India today is not because farmers did not pay back their loans. So let's be clear on that. When we talk about agriculture and typically marginal agriculture failing, it's not rocket science, right? The, the answers are not that difficult. So for instance, so Gujarat and Maharashtra were one, uh, were one state at the British time, Bombay presidency. So the British decided to invest in irrigation because neither Gujarat nor Maharashtra have any large rivers running through them. And so what they did was they invested heavily in irrigation in South Bombay presidency, which is now called Gujarat. And they also invested in the Pune area, which is today Western Maharashtra. But they did not invest in Vidharb because they considered, quote unquote, a jungle area. Right? Today, the biggest crop is cotton, both in Vidharba and in Gujarat. The agricultural input prices for cotton have risen almost three times in the last 10 years. In Gujarat, the farmers are stressed economically, right? But they're selling the textile, handloom, apparel, etc. So they're okay. In Vidharba, where there is 9% irrigation, versus 100% in Gujarat, you have one farmer suicide every day for the last seven years. Every day you have one farmer suicide, minimum, just because of lack of irrigation, lack of water. When we uh, look at what are the solutions, I just want to talk about two things. One is. Let's look at farmer incomes, right? So what does the average farmer get for his produce vis-a-vis -vis what you and I pay for that pro product? So I looked at a sleepy little town outside Lucknow in UP called Malihabad. And Malihabad is famous for its mangoes, right? And uh, the bigger farmers export their mangoes. But what did I find? I found that in Malihabad, the average farmer got 9% of the end user price for their mango. That's it. I noticed while I was coming here that there was a lot of oranges that I saw. And these oranges obviously don't come from here. They come from Maharashtra, they come from Madhya Pradesh, etc. Do you know in India what the average orange farmer gets for the orange that you pay? He gets between 3 and 4% of end user price. 
So literally, he's getting nothing for what he grows. And in India, fresh fruits, 57% of fresh fruits, all fresh fruits grown, so whether it's Kashmir, Himachal, Uttarakhand, etc., they get 57% get spoiled within 96 hours of post cultivation, of just simply because of lack of storage and lack of transportation and inclement weather. So if it rains, so just in uh, UP, for instance, 2,000 tons of mangoes are grown every year. But the storage capacity for such mangoes are 100 tons. Now, the production has remained the same for 10 years. So my question is that if you have to know that there are 2,000 tons of mangoes being produced, why not at least have half the storage? Because all that will happen is they'll end up rotting, and the farmers lose you know, whatever they can. When we look at, uh, you know, simple things, like there's a lot of talk uh, today about uh, stubble burning. You may have read it in the papers that Delhi is the most polluted uh, city in the world because Ut uh, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan all burning their crop stubble. But the thing is that it's, look, it's simple economics. So 2,500 rupees is the penalty for burning your crop stubble. And 6,000 rupees, if you include diesel, labor, and hiring machinery, is what it costs you to process that. Now, one of the things we, st we need to start looking is increasing the size of our farms while keeping ownership in individual hands. So I'm not going to use the word collectivize because that you know, brings up 1930s Russia. But I will say that if you put farms together and you cooperatize them right, while keeping individual ownership, then the average input cost falls and you benefit from economies of scale. So you can actually afford it because in India today, the marginal farmer is dying. What I also want to talk to you today about other than my book, is the fact that increasingly in India, privilege perpetuates privilege. So what do I mean by that? What is the most coveted job for an ordinary Indian young person? Tell if anybody would answer that. What's the most coveted job for an ordinary person from an ordinary family? Probably an IAS job, right? So what is the truth? So I put an RTI in, okay? And I said, I want uh, to know where these people come from. Do they come from uh, Ernakulam? Do they come from Asansol? Do they come from Riva and Balia and Udhampur? Turns out, probably not. So I wanted to basically see that when we have this ruling class of bureaucracy, what are its antecedents? Like, where do they come from? What is its provenance, right? So this is a, these are statistics I got from my RTI from the Chief Information Commissioner of India. So 84% of all serving IAS officers in the country have grown up in the 20 biggest cities of India. I repeat, 84% of all serving IAS officers in India have grown up in the 20 biggest cities in India. 81% of all serving IAS officers in India have gone to private school, which is kind of shocking in a country like ours, because I want to get to this later. And 70% of them have postgraduate degrees. Now, you know that it's not possible from a person of a middle class or lower middle class background always to go in for postgraduate education because A, it's expensive, and B, that's time away from earning money for yourself and your family. So it's not always possible. And this inequity, right, this inequality starts very early. So what do I mean by that? So there are 15 and a half lakh schools in India, okay? 15 and a half lakh schools. So when we look at the posh boards, right, the CBSC, the ICSC, the IB, right, these make up together 1.5% of the schools in India. That's it. CBSC, ISC, IB. 
all the other schools are state board, madarsa board, X board, Y board, but those, now, if you look at everybody that, ha that has in IIT today, and IIM, what is the percentage of people that have done it from IB, ICSC, and CBSC? In, in IIMs, it's 89%, and in IITs, it's 81%. So that means that from 98.5% of the Indian population that has gone to school, 9% of people have gotten into an IIT or an IIM, which is literally shows you that if you're in that top 1% of India, you make it. And if you're not, you have an infinitely high struggle to survive and thrive and break through that glass ceiling. And that to me is frightening. The Supreme Court of India in 2012 said that we will reserve 25% of seats for economically weaker sections. Today only 20% of those seats are filled. And I rem everybody knows of the case uh, of Rohit uh, Vemula. But I remember the case of Arya Prakash in IIT in Madras, in Chennai. Uh, and he wrote something, and I want to quote him, because I, uh, and he committed suicide. And he said, good coaching and excellence in the English language, an upper crust dress sense, differentiates and creates a gulf which can never be bridged. And he was from a Dalit family. He had come through merit into IIT, not through any quota. And he killed himself because he felt small. And the truth is, in India, when we say that we want students to come into normal schools under the Economic Weaker Sections Act, we don't understand the socio-psychology of a situation because if you have a child that's, say, vacationing in America, and next to him you have a child with torn shoes and torn clothes, then that child, after a little while, is not going to want to study in that milieu because he's going to feel, you know, marginalized and, and victimized and small, right? And all of you are young people. I mean, I was once young, you know? I mean, kids can be very cruel. Right, you know, particularly about that sort of thing. You know, when we look at education in this country, we have to look at inequality from a different perspective as well. Everybody talks about non-performing asset loans, right? NPAs. Do you know what the education NPAs today are in this country? Seventy thousand crores, right now. The education, sorry, the education loans are seventy thousand crores. The education NPAs are seven thousand crores. Do you know what an NPA is? So it's basically when you, when, you don't, when you can't pay back your loan, right? So if you don't pay it back three times in a row, in an ascertained time, then you become a non-performing asset, right? So education NPAs are, you know, middle class people who wanted their daughter to become a doctor or their son to become a teacher or whatever, and sooner or later they just can't pay those loans you know, ever again. I mean, 12 lakh people sat for the IIT exam last year. Only 11,000 got in, right? So if you do the mathematics, and everybody who sits for that exam takes some sort of coaching. And those coaching will cost you over two years, say about two to three lakh rupees, which for a normal person is just not easy to pay back. If you look at, uh, you know, uh, what is, the way forward, right? So I just have one suggestion. And I mean, I have a number of suggestions, but the time is less. If you take every unemployed postgraduate in this country, right? Every unemployed postgraduate in this country, and you just take 10% of them, 10% of every unemployed postgraduate in this country, and you just request them to go to a village for one year and teach school, whether it's middle school, high school, or junior school, right? You will wipe out the paucity of teachers that we have 
in one day. So if you just take 10% of all unemployed postgraduates and just request them to go to a village for one year, which I think is not a very big thing for your country, right? You will wipe out the teacher gap that we have in one day. So I think as a people, we now need to start looking at out-of-the-box solutions, right? The other thing is m many people would say, oh, but why don't they send their children to school? Why are they making them work in the fields? Because they have to, to eat, right? So if we look at non-formal education, for instance, uh, there is in Africa a scheme called Tostan, which I found in Ghana and other countries, whereby uh, they run a school as an agribusiness. So they study. And then for three to four hours a day, they also work. But they don't work as labor. They actually work to make things. So they skill up, and they earn money. And the total business makes money. And every child has a bank account, and it goes in their account. So their parents are actually incentivized to keep the children in school for a long period of time, because they're actually contributing to the family income. Uh, the, so where are the jobs of the future going to come from? So I want to talk about innovation. So over the summer, I was in America, and I had a chance to meet Jeff Bezos of Amazon. So I asked him, I said, Mr. Bezos, when you launched in India, you were number one on day one, right? He got 55% market share on day one. Now it's probably like 90. And Flipkart literally had to cut and run. You know, They sold themselves because they would have been worth nothing now. And so I asked him, how is it that you came to a complicated market like India and you just took off? And he said, see, I came to India, but before that, for seven years, I hired 1,800 people across the country to do market research. And they said to me that, you know, do, um, do this and don't do this. So I said, what did they tell you? So he said, they just told me three things. One, they said that, People have smartphones, but the smartphones uh, have memory that's very little. So if you put an app that's very heavy, the phone will crash and nobody will download it again. So produce a light app for the country. Secondly, the trader community is very vocal, it's very organized, and it's quite reactive. So if you uh, show them that they are going to basically kill all their business, they will come on the streets and like 1977, like Coca-Cola was thrown out, that will end up happening. And the third thing that uh, he said was that Indians are very sensitive to foreign invasion because they've been invaded so many times. So let not the people of India feel that this is a foreign ecosystem being imposed upon them. So he did three things. One, he had the lightest app in the world. Two, he's, it's the only country in the world where in the top 15 cities of India, if you buy anything from your corner store on Amazon, the, the corner store person gets 1% of profit. So it's actually the only country in the world we understood that in Amazon's victory has to lie people's victory. Otherwise, people are going to take it as a wrong sign. And thirdly, he launched Amazon Tatkal, which means that you could actually sell anything on Amazon within half an hour after you give proof of verification. So it's kind of like a partnership model. And you know, I thought this was amazing, because it's not easy in a country like India to just come in and be number one straight away. And so what is innovation, right? Innovation is implementing new ideas to create value for your organization. And why in India, I mean, America has 91,000 Indian origin PhDs in tech and science, 91,000. You know how many India has? 600 in tech and science. I mean, I went to NASA in uh, Houston, right? And I, uh, I said, where can I eat lunch? And they said, there's a cafeteria, so I went there. And I promise you, the only language I heard in the cafeteria was Telugu. That's the only language I heard. 
you know and uh, I said how did this happen and they said and I asked them I said where are you from and I thought they would be third and fourth generation people say we're from Virginia and we're from Wisconsin but somebody said I'm from Kakinada and somebody said I'm from you know Bhadra Chalam and you know and I thought it was amazing you know because the truth about Indians is that we are the smartest people in the world you know everywhere you go this is an accepted fact we just have to create an ecosystem where we can thrive inside our own country. So why uh, haven't we done that well on innovation? So I don't want to say a lot of things, right? but I, I do want to say this, which is, have any of you seen a show on television called Shark Tank? So a few of you, right? So, and I would advise the rest of you to have a look. Do you guys have Netflix? Okay. Do you have Netflix, Father? It's a legitimate question. <laughs> but um, so then, uh, no, so I was just saying, right? So Shark Tank, the first question that they ask you when they see your product, right, is do you have a patent? Do you have a utility patent? Do you have a design patent, right? So in Europe, in Australia and Japan, in America and China, it costs you, uh, it uh, takes you between five and eight months. Do you all know what a patent is, by the way? Okay, so it's basically a way of defining that this technology belongs to you, so if anybody else uses it, they have to pay for, for it. Now, one of the reasons uh, that this innovation has not taken off in India is where in the West it takes you six months to get a patent, in India, it takes you between three and four years to get a patent. Now, you understand better than me that if you have a technology and it takes you four years to say that technology is yours legitimately, it is obsolete by then because somebody else has cloned it in like six months, you know. So you have to move fast as an ecosystem. The other thing is how much do we pay our researchers, right? So I was looking at the Global Innovation Index report, and on average, a PhD in science, in tech, in biochemistry, in medicine, in different things, gets paid in India an average of between 1 and 1.5 lakh rupees a month. Now, that's not a bad salary. But to be honest, it's not an aspirational salary, right? Whereas a PhD in, say, America, gets paid between 150 and 250 thousand dollars a year so you know which would a person rather choose i mean even if we look at our scientists right if we look at cv raman we look at hargobind khurana we look at subramanya chandrasekhar we look at venkat raman ramakrishna all of these guys won nobel prizes but the truth is they didn't do their research in india we just put our stamp on them after they won the award. We said, oh, wow, this guy is Indian. But they did all their research abroad, which for us is nothing to be terribly proud of, right? So we have to create those facilities. I mean, I went to IIT. I'm going to IIT Bombay day after. I went to IIT to, to lecture, and I asked them that how many PhDs are there, and like 50 people put up their hand. And I said, I want to ask you an honest question, right? Have your thesis been linked with the industry that you work for? They said, no. I said, who is the only person that's read your thesis? They said, peer-reviewed journals. I said, where are those peer-reviewed journals lying right now? They're lying gathering dust in somebody's office, right? So if you do you know, biochemical uh, engineering, you should be going to a pharmaceutical company to see whether your research is worth something or not. Otherwise, what does it mean for the country to subsidize you, for you to produce academia that is meaningless? We need to start, uh, uh, we need to have a national employment policy in our country. It's extremely important and it should be done yesterday. So what do I mean by that? So what are the jobs? So I was in Bangladesh, right? And Bangladesh is the fastest growing economy in Southeast Asia today. Why? Because when they were investing in shipping, in steel, in petroleum, they were broke. Because they're not good at those things. Their competitive advantage lay elsewhere. 
And in one day, they decided that they were going to invest 20% of their GDP into textile because that's what they were good at doing and that's what they knew how to do. And now the economy is booming. Because, so I want to give you a statistic. So in India, producing one steel job, one steel job costs you 24 lakh rupees. This is one sustainable steel job, okay? And if you spend one lakh rupees in handloom, you can produce 24 sustainable jobs. So I'll say that again. For one lakh rupees, you produce 24 handloom jobs. And for 24 lakh rupees, you produce one steel job. So what should we be doing as a country? Right? We need jobs for our people. We have 130 million unemployed people in India. Right? We need to start investing in sectors that are labor intensive, that are dignified, and that can actually give India a competitive advantage. All of you have heard this. Thank you. All of you have heard this saying that India was the golden bird, right? Sone ki chiriya. Do you know where it came from? It came from Vasco da Gama when he landed in Calicut. And he said that India is like a golden bird waiting to take flight. But do you know why he came to India? He came to India to look for calico, which is unfinished cotton and silk. At that time, India was the richest country in the world. But 40% of our GDP, 40% came from textiles. Today under 2% comes from textiles. This is something we need to talk about. So what is the solutions, right? So the solutions are going to come from all of you, which is why really I've come here today. What is the expanding role of the citizen? So I was in Hyderabad the other day, uh, and I looked at the example of Ravi Teja. So Ravi was 13 years old. And he suddenly saw a pothole in the road. And he and his friends, instead of going to the municipality, started filling it with like broken bricks, gravel, etc., cement. And not only was uh, he celebrated in Telangana, but Bangalore actually started something called the BBMP Pothole Reporter, where they got him uh, and they made him design an app. So how it works is that if you upload a picture of a pothole on that app with the address, if it's not fixed or filled within one day, a hundred rupees is taken from the salary of the engineer in charge of that area, hundred rupees every day that it's not fixed, and a hundred rupees enters your account. So if we incentivize people like that, you know, things are going to change. In fact, I think they should be done in Chennai as well, you know, or in everywhere. And this is a 13-year-old guy that did it. So uh, another 13-year-old called Aditya Mukherjee in Gurgaon near Delhi has been going to every hotel, marriage hall, dhaba, you know, uh, restaurant saying, please don't use plastic. Please don't use plastic straws. Please don't use plastic bags. It's terrible for the ocean. It's terrible for the environment. And he's just been asking them to use multi-use jute bags, etc. And I would like all of you to, as much as you can, not use plastic, right? Not go to stores and take it back. You know, try and avoid it. And this 13-year-old guy has got 10 lack people to say that we give up plastic as much as we can. You know, so this is the power of young people. I want to give the example of two young people that I met in my journey that completely changed my life. This is a place of education. I met sir, a young man called Babar Ali in Bengal. And I wanted to know that why uh, Murshidabad had gone from 29% literacy to literally 80% literacy in one generation. And I asked them, and they said, you should uh, 
you should meet Babar Ali. I said, who's Babar Ali? So I went to this village called Bhapta. So Babar's story is this. When Babar was uh, very young, he was the only child who would go to school in his area. And he would go to school and he would feel very guilty that he was the only person going to school. So he would uh, come back and teach the other children underneath a guava tree. And slowly lots of kids started coming and learning from him and from other villages and he became quite well known. And then CNN heard about him before any Indian media did. And they gave him a real change maker of the year award along with 25 other people, $100,000. And any other poor person would have bought land, a house, a tractor, because he didn't have very much. But he said, no, this money has come from education, and it will go back into education. So he built a huge school in his village. And he said, there are only three rules. One, everybody who learns will learn free. Two, everybody who teaches will teach free. And three, everybody who learns will go back to their village and teach three people what they've learned that day. And then other villages started getting competitive. And they said, if this village can do it, why can't we do it? And then they started putting all their money into education as well. Today, that 65 village grouping has become an education hub. And from having roughly 35% literacy, they have 100% literacy because of one young person. So if ever you feel that you're just one person, you can't do anything, please remember this. And the other example is for all of you, and frankly all of us, who believe that life has sometimes not been so fair. I want to give you the example of Shrikant Bola. I don't know if you've heard of him. So Shrikant was born blind in a small village called Sita Ramapuram in what is now Andhra Pradesh. And he was born blind, and he was very keen on learning. So he wanted to study science in plus two. And uh, they said, uh, you know, you can't study science because how will you do the syllabus, right? How will you uh, do the experiments? So he took the, uh, the school to court. And in Hyderabad, they said, you can study whatever you want. That's your fundamental right. And he studied science, and he got 99%. After getting 99%, he got into IIT Delhi. And IIT Delhi refused to take him because they said he's blind, how will he eat, how will he live, how will he walk to school, it's not possible for us. So he said no problem. So he took a gap year and he applied to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which as you know is probably the number one tech institute in the world. And he's the first Indian who got a full scholarship. After getting a full scholarship, he, in, uh, he studied astrophysics and which as you know is pretty tough, it's astrophysics. And he topped it, he got a gold medal. And NASA, Google, Oracle, HP, Microsoft, everybody said, please come and work for us, whatever you want, we'll give you. And he said no, and he came back to India and he made a company called Bolland Industries. Today it's a 700 crore company, 5,000 people work for it, 1,500 of them are completely blind. So from having no sight, he created you know, light in the lives of so many, so many people. And I want to last end my speech by just making two observations about political reform. Because unless the political system changes, nothing will change. We, as you know, as uh, Father said, we're going to go into elections soon. Unfortunately, in India, we're always going in for elections soon. <laughs> But, uh, but I'd like to say that in the 2014 elections, 84% of the time in all Lok Sabha constituencies, the richest candidate won. 84% of the time, the richest candidate won in every Lok Sabha seat. And 100% of the time, 100% of the time, the poorest candidate in every Lok Sabha seat lost their deposit. So 84% of the time, the richest candidate won, and 100% of the time, the poorest candidate lost his deposit in every seat. So it, uh, it puts a question in my mind that has money become the only arbiter for success in Indian politics today? Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, when we look at elections, right, it's very easy to say curb uh, spending. 
But the truth is, one of the reasons that corruption is so endemic in our country is because politicians think they need to amass wealth to spend it in elections to survive again, right? And I think that we need to look at, I, I went to Norway, and I saw an amazing election model. They don't curb spending. They say, spend as much as you like. What they do is they curb the market for spending. So the entire election, end to end, is five days between the time you file your nomination, the time you get your result. There are no television ads, there are no billboards, there are no hoardings, there are no uh, newspaper ads, there are no radio ads. You cannot have a public assembly of more than a thousand people, and you cannot have more than five cars in one constituency. So it forces the person to actually go door to door and compete on the strength of their ideas which actually is what a democracy is there for. The reason that people vote for caste, religion, or region is because they actually don't know how one candidate is different from another in terms of ability, thought, etc. So they feel if all these guys are equally you know, far away from us, then we might as well vote to the person who seemingly represents us, even though he may not. And the last example I want to give is about direct democracy. See, all of you are here in Chennai, right? Are all of you, incidentally, from Chennai? So where, like, are you from different states also? OK. So let's say all of you have come together, and all of you want to put forward your views on a particular topic. Let's say there's one topic that really concerns all of you. Can you ensure that your voice reaches the highest level? Today, it's very difficult. But there are 60 countries all over the world that have a petition system. What is a petition system? A petition system is like in England, if 100,000 people get together and sign, even if it's an e-signature, right? It is ordained by law that there will be a one-hour discussion on that subject in the next session of parliament. Right? So if the students of Loyola decide that we will campaign in Chennai and get one issue, 100,000 signatures, I don't think it'll be that tough for this college, uh, you would have one hour in parliament where people discuss what you wanted them to discuss. Because that really is the meaning of democracy. So I'm campaigning for this, and I want you also to put your thoughts on the internet, Twitter, Facebook, on this because your voice does matter. You're not only the future, you're the present, right? And that's why I'm here today. And before I end, I just want to say that, you know, I go to a lot of uh, educational institutions to speak, etc. And the reason I do so is because I firmly believe in the power of people, right? I firmly believe in the viability of people power, the viability of young people, making transformative change. I believe that, for instance, i give you one example. I went all over the country and I talked to people like you, uh, and I just said one thing, that politicians should not have the right to arrogate to themselves a salary increase in parliament or assemblies when they want, right? And I kept saying this. And one day, uh, I saw that so many people had petitioned the prime minister, the finance minister, several people on this issue, right? That late Anand Kumar, who just passed away, who's the parliamentary affairs minister, he said to me that you're going all over the country and so many people are responding to this very issue, that if a doctor can't uh, decide you know, how much salary he gets, and if a professor can't decide how much salary he gets, then how can a politician just raising their hands increase their salaries at will? This is anti-democratic. And I said, sir, I truly believe it. And they passed a legislation in the last budget saying that now there will be a constitutional statutory body that will study this, and politicians can't just increase their salaries whenever they want. And that came from people like you, the power of people like you. So that's why I'm here today. All of you are going to be wildly successful in the future. You're all going to be very prestigious, make money. All your dreams will probably come true. But I want to say one thing to you, that a life of, that is 
truly enriched is a life of purpose, right? You can have a big car, you can have a big home, you can go abroad for holidays, you can be famous, but it all adds up to nothing if you haven't led a life of dignity and of purpose. And purpose comes from benefiting somebody other than yourself and your immediate people. And whatever your success is, whatever your triumphs, whatever your journey, please keep the last man in India in your mind. Because if every action of yours keeps that last man in India in mind, your life will be full of purpose and your life would have meant something. Gandhi said that poverty is the greatest form of violence. Let us together end that violence through our lives. Thank you so much. <laughs>